Week 1. Realism What is realism? According to William Dean Howells, realism is nothing more and nothing less than the truthful treatment of material. In other words, realist writers focused on life as it is, without idealization, without rendering things as beautiful or pleasant or optimistic when they are not. They strove to portray common people in everyday life. But what caused this shift from Romanticism with writers like Poe, Hawthorne, and Melville, who focused on romanticizing the past, nature, and noble characters, and Transcendentalism with writers like Emerson and Thoreau, who sought to transcend everyday experience through nature? Many believe that American realism was the product of a country shaken by war combined with technological advances and increased consciousness of nationhood. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase added a huge amount of territory to the country. Additionally, the Mexican War brought the entire Southwest, including California, into the nation and the discovery of gold in California increased the pace of Western movement tremendously. The Civil War had left the country morally exhausted, but prosperous economically. The first transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869. The telegraph, electricity, and the telephone were also introduced. Manufacturing and factory work grew substantially. Industry captains like Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and John D. Rockefeller created monopolies and enormously profitable enterprises such as steel, oil, and railroads. The rapid transcontinental settlement and new urban industrial conditions had a significant impact on the literature of the time. New themes, new forms, new subjects, new regions, new authors, and new audiences all emerged in the half-century following the Civil War. In fiction, characters rarely represented before the Civil War became familiar figures. Industrial workers and the rural poor, ambitious business leaders and vagrants, prostitutes and unheroic soldiers. In other words, realists wrote about ordinary people in ordinary circumstances who typically belong to the middle class, just like the average reader of magazines and newspapers, the most common style of publishing at the time. These characters were usually representative, that is, composites of the sort of people readers thought they already knew, people without fame or huge fortunes, without startling accomplishments or immense abilities. On occasion, however, realists like Edith Wharton and Henry James would focus on the interior moral and psychological lives of upper-class people, although always taking care in describing these people's surroundings. Setting is also important in realist writings. Stories were told about places that actually existed or could actually exist. Additionally, they were interested in recent or contemporary life, not in history or legend such as the Romantics. Other writers used realism to describe, analyze, and critique the social, economic, and political institutions that had emerged in this period of rapid growth and change. They focused on subjects such as women's rights, political corruption, the exploitation of labor, and racial inequality. An example of this can be seen in Twain's famous novel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Twain was known for using exaggeration, humor, and vernacular storytelling in his writing. This week we will start to read Huck Finn. Keep an eye out for example of some of these characteristics as you read. Finally, it is also important to note that realism also has subcategories, naturalism and regionalism or local color. Many of the realist writers fall into more than one ism. We will start to discuss each of these subcategories after we focus on some of the most well-known realist writers, Mark Twain and Henry James. Samuel L. Clemens, who wrote under the pen name of Mark Twain, a sailor's term for two fathoms deep or safe water, was born on November 30, 1835 and grew up in a Mississippi River town in Missouri. After his father died when he was 12, 
Twain worked as a journeyman printer and later as a Mississippi Riverboat pilot. In 1861, the first year of the Civil War, Twain went west with his brother. This move started him on the path toward his life as a humorist, lecturer, journalist, and author. In Roughing It, Twain fictionally elaborated the brothers' stagecoach adventures on the way to Carson City, debunking the idea of the West as a place where fortunes could easily be made, and showed its disappointing and even brutal side. He tried to tell Eastern readers what the West was really like, while exulting in the freedom and outright craziness of Western startup towns and encampments, operating far from Eastern laws, orthodoxies, and even common sense. Twain began Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in 1876 as a sequel to Tom Sawyer and finished it in 1884. In recent years, the racial and racist implications of Huck Finn have been the subjects of critical debate, as have questions about the racial beliefs of the author. Similar questions have been raised about gender and sexuality in Twain's life and work. In Twain's own day, Huck Finn was banned in many libraries and schools around the country and denounced in pulpits not for its racial content, but for its supposedly encouraging boys to swear, smoke, and run away. Nevertheless, Huck Finn has enjoyed extraordinary popularity since its publication. It broke literary ground as a novel written in the vernacular. Overall, Twain knew the nation's various regions and its history. He represented, expressed, and attacked the American character all at once. Humor was his way of bringing together these three approaches. Henry James was born in New York City on April 15, 1843. Even though the highly cultivated characters in his fiction ran counter to the vernacular tradition popularized by Mark Twain, James attracted, in his own lifetime, a select company of admirers and made a good living from his publications. His writings, the product of more than half a century as a publishing author, include tales, novellas, novels, plays, autobiographies, criticism, travel pieces, letters, reviews, and biographies, altogether perhaps as many as 100 volumes. James's older brother, William, was America's first notable psychologist and perhaps its most influential philosopher. After moving back and forth between America and Europe and after trial residences in France and Italy, James settled permanently in England in 1876. Daisy Miller, with its portrayal of the new American girl, brought him widespread popularity. In this study, as it was originally subtitled, a stubbornly naive American girl willfully resists European and American social mores. These works show James as a true cosmopolitan concerned with exploring American national character as it is tested by cultural displacement. In Daisy Miller in particular, James's skillful use of the limited point of view depicts a character who is himself limited by self-absorption and class position and who is thus unable to see Daisy for who she is. This narrative device, described by Percy Lubbock as the use of a focal character or narrator somewhere over the protagonist's left shoulder, became an increasingly important part of James's technique. In Daisy Miller and other works written during the 1870s, James was already developing the hallmarks of his later greatness. He was also beginning to make problems of knowledge, whether characters' knowledge of each other or reader struggles with deliberately limited information, the central drama of his texts. Despite their considerable difficulty, most of James's novels and tales have remained in print. The rich depth of his work, especially his incisive psychological renderings of why people do the things they do, has continued to attract literary scholars and critics, as well as millions of readers around the world. For this week's discussion post, I would like you to consider the following idea in question. James is often mentioned as one of the pioneers of cosmopolitan fiction, narratives about people who live and think in international ways, escaping from the supposed parochialism of national identity. Does this story offer any cautions about that frame of mind, about the possible dangers of forgetting where one comes from and forgetting the prevailing values and temperament of one's own place? Can you apply this lesson to your own life?